Hello, everybody, and welcome to tonight's presentation. Um, I'm Carney McRae with the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge, and we're delighted to be here in this virtual world, allowing uh, people who can't get to our Rockland Visitor Center to also take advantage of um, hearing um, and listening in on some of our programs. I would like to introduce Sarah Williams. Um, this is, this is how I get to see Sarah because she's up in the Millbridge office and I'm down in the Rockland office. And she's a wildlife biologist uh, for the Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. She's been working out of the Millbridge office and has been there for 13 years and for the Fish and Wildlife Service for 26 years. So um, welcome Sarah and we're, I'm really excited to hear about what you have to say about this lovely wildlife refuge that I'm a part of. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen really quick. I just wanted to say hi to some of my friends that are here and my mom, I think this might be her first Zoom meeting. Um, so good job, mom. And um, we'll go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, so I thought the best of would be a good subject to talk about because um, people have a lot of complaints about 2020 it being a bad year and um, when I think about this refuge there's so many positive good things about it that it seemed like we could all use some good news and some highlights of, of positive things that are still going on in the world despite coronavirus and um, all of the other struggles that we've been going through. Um, so thank you, friends of Maine Coastal Islands, for inviting me to talk to you tonight. Um, so Kearney said I've, I've been here for about 13 years, and um, I'm going to be talking in, in three different parts. So the first part is um, an update on the 2020 breeding season. Um, for seabirds. Uh, the second part is just going to be some highlights of our research that we've done over the last couple of years. And then the third part are some of my favorite islands. Um, so let's see why this is not advancing. There it is. Um, so this is who we are. Um, this is one of the best things about the refuge. Um, the staff were an incredible team. It's the hardest working crew that I think I've ever worked with. Um, and they're all just incredible people as well. Um, so one of the best things of the refuge is definitely the people. Um, and I have to say too, there are some island technicians on the call tonight too, working with our incredible technicians um, is also one of the best parts of the refuge. So I work in the Millbridge office with um, Jim, and I don't know if I can point here. This is Jim, Linda, and Teresa. That's me. Um, and then our Roger is our seasonal. Um, and in the Rockland office, we have Michael, Eddie, Brian, and Jay. So I live in Cherryfield. Um, this is a view from Tunk Mountain. And my house is somewhere over here in the upper left-hand corner. Um, and one thing I really love about Down East Maine, I think a lot of people on the call probably live in mid coast area or, or even farther. Um, one of the things I love the most about it is our community, um, the quiet, the natural world and undeveloped lands. Um, but I have to say being offshore, having that opportunity to get to some of these islands um, is really incredible. And just a Quick background too, I started my job as um, just how I got into the service. If you have any um, children or friends or nephews or nieces, um, I started out in a college program that is now, um, it was called the Student Career Experience Program. I think it's now called Pathways. I'm not sure what the status is now, but um, basically they take college kids and Kind of launch them into 
um, time with the Fish and Wildlife Service and um, I was lucky enough to get a permanent job. Um, and so, yeah, so I started at a ridiculously young age when I was in high school. Um, so this has been my only employer since I was 15. Um, and I worked at Stuart B. McKinney Refuge in Connecticut. Um, after college, I went to Virginia Tech and um, I moved to Maine in 2007. So the refuge, um, we have 72 islands that span the entire coast of Maine. Um, we have four mainland units that are um, all down east. So in Steuben and Millbridge um, and Korea in Gouldsboro. Um, we manage just over um, 5,500 acres of island habitat and also 8,400 acres of mainland habitat. Um, so our seabird updates, um, our seabird restoration islands, I, I'm hoping that some of you are familiar with the program. Um, we manage these islands that are on this map and staff them with people to protect breeding seabirds. Um, the most important part of our management is predator control. We also do habitat management to keep the site suitable for the birds. Um, but between the service and National Audubon, um, there's even an island, uh, CV Islands actually in New Hampshire. Um, we have quite a crew of people across the entire coast that are doing monitoring throughout the summer. And it was um, pretty interesting this year with the, the pandemic. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to have a field season. It was a little bit delayed. And what we did is, um, we cut down our crew sizes. So each island had two people. Um, we brought them to the island and they had to quarantine from each other for two weeks. So we actually had two field camps set up on each island and it worked out really well. Um, the attitude of our crews were exceptional. Um, it seemed like they were appreciative to be in a safe place <laughs> for, um, the three months or two months of the summer that they were out there. Um, so we had uh, Joe and Amanda on Petite Manan, Andy and Percy on ship, and Sequoia and Emma. And Sequoia and Emma are actually on the call. Um, they were out at Matinic. And um, I have to give a shout out also to the Menon Foundation who has funded um, some of our technicians. And um, yeah, they've been really supportive and um, So one of the, the biggest, uh, most frequent questions I get from people is, um, so the figure of the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of all of the oceans in the world. Um, most people that I talk to in Maine say like, well, why is that? And um, I think that instead of trying to give like a very vague, um, un undetailed explanation, I thought I would go straight to the source of um, the person who came up with this research and who cited that figure. Um, and this is where we're at. So this is sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Maine. And if you look at the black line, it's an average of um, the 1982 to 2011 temperature the purple is the range, the highs and the lows um, within that time frame, And the red line is 2020. And the data point stops in August. Um, but in 2013, we thought we had, we had the hottest year on record and we were all very concerned. And since then, um, I guess 2019 was considerably cooler, but basically, um, almost the last 10 years, we've had record temperatures and 2020 was no exception. So we broke another record, which um, is a little concerning for sure for our marine e ecosystem and also the seabirds that we're managing. Okay, so I'm gonna try this. So this is Andrew Pershing. Um, 
this research that he did about the Gulf of Maine warming was, um, he's actually working for a different um, group now, a climate change group, I don't know the name, but um, this is the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And um, we're just gonna watch a quick video on why the Gulf of Maine is warming so fast. Let's try this again. Wherever you look in the global ocean, you're gonna find an area that's warming, uh, but places are warming at different rates. And right now the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming places in the global ocean. We really started looking carefully at the temperature here in the Gulf of Maine in 2012, which was our ocean heat wave year. It was the warmest year ever in the Gulf of Maine. And what set us off trying to understand uh, the, the temperature patterns in the Gulf was, was really driven by all of the things that people were bringing into the lab. Uh, black sea bass, blue crabs, seahorses, all of these species that we think of as coming from south of Cape Cod were suddenly showing up on the shores here in Maine. And so we started looking at the temperature records, really focusing on the satellite data that goes back to the early 1980s. And when you break apart that data, uh, you see that, well, there's a, there's a gradual trend uh, that we've had in the Gulf of Maine. It's about four times the global average rate. Uh, but a lot of our warming has occurred since 2004. And so from 2004 through 2016, we warmed faster than 99% of the global ocean. So when people ask me why the Gulf of Maine is warming so fast, well, the short answer is that it's due to man-made global warming and changing ocean currents. And we can think of that really in three steps. So man-made global warming, we have extra carbon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can't believe me clicking on that stopped it. Sorry about that, guys. It's water that forms in the North Atlantic. All right, I think we we're or warming. But the Gulf of Maine is warming faster. There we go. Why is that? Sorry. Well, that's step two. So step two is that the North Atlantic uh, has a really unique uh, circulation pattern that's driven by cold, dense water that forms in the North Atlantic. Adding a little bit of fresh water due to melting in the Arctic and melting in Greenland messes up that, that cold, sinking water and that changes the whole circulation patterns in the North Atlantic. And step three is the Gulf of Maine is in this really unique part of that, of that global circulation. So we're right at the boundary between these cold and warm water masses or cold and warm currents. And the little bit of warming, the changes in the fresh water mean that the warm current winds in the Gulf of Maine, and it's just like a bathtub. We are turning on the, cold, the, on the warm water tap, and we're turning, turning the cold water tap down and the Gulf of Maine warms up really fast. It's okay. So thanks for sitting through that. Um, it's nice to hear it from the horse's mouth instead of, oh, cold water currents and the Labrador current. Um, there's some really good information that was designed for the general public on the Gulf of Maine. So I recommend checking them out if it's something you're interested in. Go to the next. Okay, so what does this mean for our birds? Um, well, the good news is um, right now we're, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of our population numbers. So um, just for context, the Gulf of Maine, um, where Maine actually has about 10,000 pairs of common terns, 2,300 pairs of Arctic terns, and only 219 pairs of roseate terns, which are federally endangered. Um, if you look at Massachusetts, uh, Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge has 14,000 um, in a single location. So um, we are the only place in the United States um, on the East Coast, there are a few in Alaska that have Arctic terns. So we take this very seriously. Um, Arctic terns, as you know, have the longest migration of any bird, they go from the Arctic to the Antarctic in a single migration cycle. Um, and um, there are, in terms of common terns, there are populations further south of us. Um, but roseate terns are only in New England, um, in the northwestern Atlantic population. And um, we also are very concerned about them. So. Um, so we're doing pretty well with common terns. Our numbers are increasing. 
Arctic terns, we've had um, some concerning declines in recent years, but um, overall our population is pretty stable. And this is a lot, but um, the graphs on the right show the population in blue that nests on the refuge and the population in orange that occurs in the state. So we're, this refuge is highly responsible for Arctic terns. Um, on the left, these are island specific population trends. If you have a favorite island, I thought you might wanna see where you fall on the list. Um, we only have Arctic terns on four of the islands. The bottom graph is common terns. Um, there are more islands with common terns. And 2020 is, um, we're doing okay. Um, it's kind of the take home of that. Puffins and razorbills, um, these populations are not surveyed every year and it's also very difficult to do a comprehensive survey. So we kind of get like every five years an estimate of what our population is. And um, for Atlantic puffins, um, we're holding steady at about like 1300 pairs total. 90% um, of those are on three islands. Razorbills, um, which I'm not sure why people aren't as in love with razorbills as I am. Um, they're pretty amazing birds, really deep divers. Uh, we only have 750 pairs, but um, if you look at Machia Seal Island, which is just on the border of the United States and New Brunswick, um, their populations are much higher and for both species, their, their core of their range is really in Atlantic Canada. Um, so we have been seeing increases in general with um, Atlantic puffins and razor bills and um, that's good news. So one of my goals here is um, to remind you of the good things that are happening. Um, this is kind of interesting. So when we think about the warming temperatures, um, some of the things we've been seeing when you look at productivity, I didn't even explain that. Um, it's the number of chicks that each pair can raise until it fledges. And so we've seen a lot of um, fluctuations in productivity. We've also seen a lot of variation in diets and even periods where um, there's scarcity of food. Um, and it's really hard to tease that information out and in, in how it actually relates to warming water temperatures. There's a lot of indirect effects. It's a very complex food web. Um, but I thought this was kind of interesting to look at. This is the average hatch date of our chicks um, on all of our islands in Maine. And uh, what you can see is that the trend is leaning towards earlier hatch dates. Um, so we don't know exactly if this means that their incubation period is shorter or if they're arriving earlier. Um, the average incubation time is about 21 days for both Arctic and common terns. Um, but I looked at the data in every different combination and, and this definitely is the trend. You can see it's only by a few days, but in, um, we, have, we have noticed that. Um, you know, turns were arriving earlier and earlier and, and we'd have to try to get students earlier on the islands and they were often taking their exams. And um, so there, there definitely are some effects. Um, this is one of them. So productivity is the number of chicks that fledge per pair. And if you look at the entire Gulf of Maine or even the whole state, um, we're seeing regional differences between the Eastern Gulf of Maine and the Western Gulf of Maine, which relates to our different currents that we have. Um, so as far as we can tell, we were a little bit concerned um, back in 2012, 2013. Um, it looked like, you know, productivity was going down for everyone, but we've had some decent years, the last five years. And um, the trends have kind of leveled out, um, but it is interesting. There's a definite like inverse relationship here between the Eastern Gulf of Maine and the Western. And um, we believe a lot of that relates to food variability within the Gulf. Um, so productivity, we have 
Um, this is the type of variation that I was talking about from 2001 to 2020. Um, but as you can see, out of our, our five refuge islands, I left Pond Island off. Um, there is one more refuge island that could have been here. Um, generally, the islands are responding similarly. And again, this is related to you could have weather, predation, um, food, um, also like condition of the bird when they arrive. Um, so there's some um, more than likely delayed effects of their condition on the wintering grounds when they arrive. And um, so that's, I didn't get into provisioning or food, but that's 2020. Um, those are our numbers. It's we're holding strong. Um, one of the, I thought I would just quickly touch on um, Ship Island this year, because they were kind of our um, biggest change in, um, in predators. So Ship Island has been having, since 2010, we restarted that restoration program and things are, are going really well. Um, we have anywhere from like 400 to 650 pairs of common terns. Um, but the last couple of years, we've had the birds abandon. We believe due to an owl, we've trapped a couple owls out there in the past. Um, but they've abandoned with no sign of a predator and then eventually returned. So there was total abandonment in um, 2018. 2019, they abandoned around June 5th and didn't come back until June 26 and started breeding normally. Um, and then in 2020, they did the same thing, but it was for a shorter period. So we we're still able to um, pull off a good season out there this year. Um, but we are constantly on our toes with um, harassing peregrines from islands, um, looking for more clever ways to trap mink and great horned owls. Um, it's a, a constant battle. And another update that I don't know if you know about. Um, so we're also managing habitat. We have a lot of invasive plant control going on on um, about 10 different islands. Um, but I would just, since we're on ship, wanted to mention that we've, we're in now the, the second year of a sheep grazing study for Ship Island. Um, and these data points on the left are all of our monitoring plots. Um, so we're monitoring the habitat at the turn nest, but then also at random points within the colony. And we had a botanist um, do a complete map of the vegetation. Um, and what, what's happening is um, not only do we have almost every invasive species we don't want, um, but we have um, non-native, non-invasive species that act invasive on our island. Um, we've created this uh, gravel restoration area for turn nesting because the, the birds get washed out every June or July. There's a high tide on a, a full moon and a storm and um, the eggs are flooded. So we created this gravel area to put them higher on the beach. And this is what it usually looks like um, by the end of the chick rearing period in August. So we're battling vegetation. We've tried burning, mowing, herbicide, hand pulling, um, and we'd like to try sheep. So um, stay tuned on that. We haven't put them out there yet. Um, we're hoping that we can have a normal season where the birds show up when they're supposed to and no owls come, um, but we haven't gotten there yet. So, um, there are several other refuge islands with sheep and Matinic is one of them. Um, Libby Island is another and the habitat, um, you know, as long as you properly manage the size of the flock actually creates good habitat for our birds. It's a lot less work on us. Um, so another thing we're trying at Petite Manan, um, we have, it's a very low island with a lot of cobble and not much for permanent puffin burrows on the island. Um, storms every winter wash the cobble. And um, so we're, we put in some artificial puffin structures. We only put in about a dozen, but we're pretty excited about them. And we're hoping that it's a good temporary solution. 
to improving our puffin habitat. Um, we have anywhere from 60 to 100 pairs typically on Petite Manan, and every year we're trying to fix the burrows. Um, I have a couple ideas for, for having a, a large scale permanent project um, that would, I think, require some grant funding, but um, this is a good solution. So it's basically just a culvert that we've cut into pieces and buried, and um, we have an entrance tube and we've covered it completely with rocks. But the nice thing about it too is that we have um, boards on top so we can access the burrows for monitoring the chicks. So we'll let you know how it goes with those. And that's all I have for 2020. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, let's see if we can, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box and um, I will let Sarah know. Um, and also just uh, for some of you, I know we've, we've had some issues over on Facebook Live. It, I think I got it set up wrong and the, Facebook changed things again. So um, we will, we are recording this tonight and we will have something, this recording up on Facebook uh, next week for people to see. So um, not seeing any questions right now. Okay. So want to continue, Sarah, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I'll move right on. Um, so some research and monitoring because of the pandemic, uh, we weren't able to continue our research, um, especially for tracking studies, but we did pull off a few things. Um, one that's pretty easy is collecting poop from the seabirds that our, our seabird technicians graciously did for us. Um, and this is something that we started back in 2017 and we've um, collected samples every year. Right now we're working with um, a postdoctoral student at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And the cool thing is that you can analyze the DNA within the fecal samples and identify fish species, um, which is really incredible technology. There's still some kinks that are being worked out. Um, the data from 2018 um, had some strange anomalies in it. So we're looking at that again, um, or we've asked Gemma to look at it again. Um, 2019, the analysis was held up because of the pandemic, but we're, um, we're still collecting samples. So this is an Ad Atlantic puffin example diet. Um, and the really cool thing is we can watch the burrows or watch the turn nests and see what the adults are bringing to the chicks, but we don't know what the adults are feeding themselves. Um, so this gives us really interesting insight into what the adults are feeding on and also um, if you could collect this information over the breeding season, you could get different periods of the breeding season. So um, they may change their foraging behavior depending on their energetic needs with, um, with breeding, laying eggs, feeding chicks. Um, so it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, on the, we are doing provisioning observations on the right hand example of what our crews could see from photographs of um, deliveries to puffin chicks. So it's mostly hake, um, there's some herring, um, the dark green is unknown. Gadids are um, also, let's see, that's uh, also in the, um, the hake family and sandlands. But when we look at the fecal DNA analysis, um, there's more species than we've been able to identify and um, more specificity to. It takes out those unknowns. Okay, I'm gonna try to move through this really fast because I wanna get to the end where um, I can show you all my favorite islands. I don't wanna run out of time for that. Um, we have 72 islands. We're collecting botanical information on as many as possible. This is a, a map that shows which islands we have data from and which islands we don't. The red is um, we have no information. Um, we keep getting close to collecting all of the data we can and then we acquire more islands, so more come on the list. Um, but this is really exciting. This is the largest 
um, coastal island remain botanical inventory um, data set that exists in, in the state. We've been plugging away at it with any extra funds and I've gotten some grants for it too from our regional office. Um, we're getting really close and we're planning on doing additional surveys. Um, so a new acquisition that we just got, Hardhead Island, um, and some that we've had for a while. But um, the cool thing is Maine Natural History Observatory is our partner who is doing the majority of this work, um, has a new down east wildflower guide coming out. Um, it looks like you can pre-order it now. It's not actually ready, but our kind of tried and true book that we've used for the islands has always been the Acadia guide, which I'm like, Ugh. It's just Mount Desert Island. That's just not fair. There's a lot more going on on, on islands than what Mount Desert Island has. Um, and so this book is, is really exciting and it includes, um, he was able to do this because of all the work the refuge has funded for these surveys. So I'm really excited about this. Um, and another, Cool research projects. So this was done in 2018, um, but we have a, a paper, it's in review right now on attachment methods. So we put five um, satellite tags on common terms in 2018 to test the technology. We used harnesses. Um, the tags are only two grams, they're solar powered. And we we're really excited because um, the birds transmitted not only during the breeding season, which we're very interested in studying the foraging behavior of these birds in the Gulf of Maine, that's our goal, um, but they also wore the tags all the way down to South America and came back again. Um, so we have a paper that we're working on now on attachment methods, and we're gonna start another one on the actual movements of the birds um, this winter. So this isn't, um, yeah, I wouldn't say that this, the satellite data was really exciting. It didn't give us the specific information we're really looking for for foraging um, in the Gulf of Maine. And um, we've tried other tags. So there's geolocator tags, which hold a lot of promise, but we're still working out the, the attachment technique on that. Um, that was a, a project we weren't able to do this past year because of the pandemic. Um, so this is just an example of the data. Um, so basically, this female fledged her chick at Petite Manan on July 18. Um, she left Maine on July 31st, um, went straight to Cape Cod, and arrived the same day. It's a pretty short trip. And then took off for South America on August 6th. Um, that's very similar to the other female that we, we put a tag on. Um, this male, his nest failed, but um, he hung around Maine until the chicks, if he had had a chick, it would have fledged um, somewhere around the first week of August. Um, he left Maine August 19th, went down to Cape Cod, um, and departed for South America on September 15th. Um, so this is pretty interesting because the females, as soon as their chick is out of the nest, um, they're gone. The males will stay in Maine for several weeks. Um, I assume with the chicks, but we don't have specific data on that, although um, rosy terns definitely do that. And then they're leaving um, during their migration September 15th the females are already in South America um, the first week in August. So it's a pretty different strategy. Um, and I've, I'm pretty excited about this. I'm hoping if we can publish this data, um, there's a way you can actually publish the animation. And so this is an example that one of our colleagues, um, Pam Loring created. Let's see if it'll work. No, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, 
But basically the terns flew through several hurricanes. The males were at higher risk of um, hurricanes than the female based on their timing. And this project was funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management um, to help assess the impact of um, offshore wind on our birds. And so there, there is a report that was done and given to BOEM um, showing when the birds go through different lease areas. And um, we know for sure that offshore wind is, it's definitely um, on the increase. We haven't seen a lot of it yet, but um, there are a lot of lease areas out there and there are a lot of projects that are being considered. So um, we're hoping that we can get more data of this kind um, just to help guide the placement and the operation of those structures. Um, so we had a couple years of complete migration. We we're for females, we're pretty excited that they didn't follow land. They flew directly across the ocean, um, basically nonstop, and um, arrived in South America within five days or so. Um, and this is uh, their wintering areas. So the females spent most of their time at the mouth of the Amazon. Um, the male before his transmitter failed um, was on his way down to the Patagonian shelf which is in Argentina. This is a highly productive area for seabirds. Um, um, so very exciting. You'll see more of that hopefully in uh, published literature soon. Um, another exciting thing is the refuge started tagging great shearwaters um, a long time ago now um, here. And we, uh, Linda has some great connections. This is Linda Welch. Um, and we've been going down to um, work with NOAA out of um, Situate, Massachusetts to tag shearwaters there. That's where shearwaters are entering the Gulf of Maine at the beginning of their, their winter, which is our summer. Um, so this is our tagging team. And um, whenever we're on the boat, we're surrounded by humpback whales that are bubble feeding. And um, it's just an incredible place to be. Um, so there is a paper that just came out. Um, Linda is a co-author co -author on that. And um, when I mentioned offshore wind, this kind of information is, is really important. Um, so the, the bottom right, that's a great shearwater on the top right. The bottom right shows their um, activity patterns and their movements during our summer, which is, um, they call it the austral, austral winter, I guess, for them. Um, and on the right, it's a, an overlay. The black dots are actually sand lance. Um, and these birds are, are focusing in on sand lance is what this paper um, discovered, which is great information to have published. And um, another paper, it's been a good year for papers. Um, is the role of sandlands in the Northwest Atlantic ecosystem. Um, so we know that 95% of roseate tern diets are sandlands. Um, humpback whales feed on sandlands. Um, our birds in Maine eat sandlands. And this was basically a forage fish that was um, hard to document and also um, not regulated in any way. So. Um, we're glad to hear that Massachusetts put a moratorium on sandlands harvest for now, um, but there's still, we're, we're trying to get the information out there so that if this becomes a fishery, it's well regulated and they're going to leave enough for our wildlife. Um, another cool thing, we do statewide surveys of gulls and cormorants in Maine using aerial photography, and um, we did it. The last one was in 2019. We don't have the results yet. Um, we've definitely seen declines in numbers. So, um, and they're kind of regional too, which is interesting. Um, different counties have um, more significant, significant declines than others. Like if you look at um, 
Knox County. Um, we went from 7,600 herring gulls in 2008 to 2,400 in 2013. Um, the declines haven't been as significant in Hancock or Washington counties, but um, yeah, this is really interesting data. We think of these birds as um, as not not as specialist as our our alcids and our terns. They can kind of like eat a wide range of food. And um, if these birds are declining, um, we'd like to know why and what's going on. Um, so the new survey is actually being counted by two students at the University of Maine, and they are using artificial intelligence to train basically a computer to count these images for us. Um, they're also experimenting with drone imagery, um, which is pretty exciting. Right now we're hiring a plane to fly the entire state and we are doing all of this counting by hand. Um, so this is gonna be automated with fingers crossed. So they're working on that now. Um, another thing we're thinking about are petrels. We have um, over just over 10,000 pairs in the state of Maine. Um, and Canada is really, again, like the core of their range. There are millions in Canada, but they've seen really significant declines in the last five years. Um, we're not seeing those declines, um, but we also haven't done a comprehensive survey since 1999. Um, so uh, the Refuge, Audubon, and the state and some other partners got together to figure out how we can re-census our islands and um, try to understand what's happening with petrels in Maine. So we are um, doing some tracking studies. There's a, a student, Sam Albright, who's looking at acoustics of petrels on islands. Um, these birds, so when they do a foraging trip, they leave their chick or their egg in the burrow and they travel for anywhere from four days and they um, can go up to um, 250 to 500 miles distance from the colony and about anywhere from 560 to 1300 miles um, cumulative in one foraging trip. Um, so if you see this area, so this is the Gulf of Maine here, um, this is a really cool thing. So um, the refuge, Brian Benedict, our manager, was uh, managing the new Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument for the last few years. Um, he's passed the torch on to somebody else, but um, this area was established not that long ago and the more tracking data we're getting um, so there's some for Atlantic puffins and now for leeches storm petrels um, shows that you know our birds are using this area so it's it's nice to see conservation efforts come together and that's it for research so Sarah we did um, have a question um, about what four islands do razor bills nest on so we have razor bills on Matinicus frock, seal, and um, Petite Manan Island, very small numbers. Um, puffins are also on Eastern Egg Rock and Stratton. Okay, great. If anybody else has any other questions, you can uh, type them into the chat box. And we'll just take a second and then we'll go on to uh, Sarah's favorite refuge places. <laughs> this is a, thanks for hanging in there guys. This feels like it's taking a long time, but I'm gonna whip through. These are just pictures. So very little talking. <laughs> We're gonna go really fast. Okay. Um, take your time. We wanna see these places. <laughs> okay. Okay, so some of my favorite refuge islands. Um, just so you know, most of these are seabird islands and they're closed during the summer. Um, so don't go out there when the birds are breeding. Um, usually it's, they're open again in, at the end of July, but some are closed a little bit longer. And we will soon, hopefully on our new website, have a table of all of our islands and you can look up when they're open and when they're closed and what you can do there if you can camp or not. Um, but just call the refuge if 
you want to go visit any of these, which you will definitely want to go. Um, so the first island is Spectacle Island, and it's um, just under five acres, and it's in Eastport. And I love this island because it's an incredible cormorant island. Um, these are cormorant nests, very artistic. Um, also, the Bay of Fundy is just an interesting place to go and to be. Um, Old Man is my next top choice. It's six acres in Cutler. It has a really interesting um, topography with sea stacks, which I don't have great pictures of Old Man, but these are sea stacks. And um, the coolest part about this island is that there are um, unmanaged successfully breeding razorbills. Um, this is one of the only islands that there's another one nearby called Pulpit Rock in Jonesport, but um, these birds are there without any assistance. And it's kind of nice to know that that's possible. Still, we do so much intensive management that it's really cool to see a place um, that is just working. And there are also other species there. Um, so those are some razor bills. There's um, herring and black beckles and also cormorants. Next island is Eastern Brothers. Um, this is Eastern Brothers in um, Jonesport. And we tried to do a restoration project on this island for 10 years. It was exhausting. We were completely unsuccessful, um, but I wouldn't trade, wouldn't trade it. Um, it was worth a shot. We had a lot of mink predation and we tried to attract terns and alcids and it, it just didn't work. Um, so this is our field camp. We put decoys out on these cliffs and I am actually on top of this rock, which looks really dangerous <laughs> from this perspective. Um, we were so grateful to finish this project because no one got hurt. None of our technicians, um, none of us. And Linda and I were just like, how would, yeah, anyway, I'm just so glad no one got hurt. And um, anyway, it was a lot of work moving solar panels and marine batteries on and off this island every year for the sound systems that we had set up. We had electric fence for sheep, um, carrying marine batteries up that giant hill that you saw was also um, really fun. And um, the view that you have from this island is incredible. It looks a lot like Ireland. Um, you can see the islands down east. You can see Machia Seal Island on a good day. Um, it's really beautiful. And the plants. So there's um, sedum and harebells and blue flag iris, which um, we have beachhead and blue flag, which are two different subspecies. And I tried my hardest to figure out the difference and never did. Um, but also a rare blinks is on this island, just a tiny little plant in a crack in a rock. You would never notice it. You would step on it. Um, but the plants on these islands are, are really fascinating. Libby Island. Libby Island's 43 acres. It's in Machias Port. It's also really hard to get on and off of. Um, it has a lighthouse. It's uh, near Big Libby, which you'll see some pictures of in a minute. This is fireweed that the day we visited, there were um, monarch butterflies and bumblebees, swarms of them all across the island. Um, really incredible. There's also cranberries and a black sand beach um, and birds. Really incredible. Big Libby is, can, is its biggest, its next neighbor, um, it's much larger. It's actually owned by the state. And we do, um, every time we do an, a statewide gull and cormorant census, we visit these islands and do ground counts of the birds. Um, so that's how I've, I've been on Big Libby and it's also spectacular. Um, that's for Dora. Halifax Island, another one of my favorites, it has, um, a large, like more than half of the island is a bog habitat. Um, Halifax is 75 acres, it's in Jonesport. Um, this is actually one of our only main island trail sites that allows camping for people that are paddling the main island trail. Um, the bog is closed, but you're 
up on top of the, the hill on the island. And this is the view. Again, we're looking um, down east. And um, the bog habitat is in the center. Um, and this is one of my favorite pictures of our staff. This was from probably six years ago or something. Next island is Jordan's Delight, um, has a natural arch, which is really cool. Um, Guillemot's nest on the cliffs, and we actually had our first peregrine falcon nesting on this, this cliff this year. They're also cormorants. Petite Manan, uh, beautiful eggs. <laughs> View from the lighthouse. Um, the, the shore and the swell and landing on this island is also can be very exciting. Um, so the boat ramp is, is a place I've spent a lot of time waiting and, and hoping and rowing. Um, and it's uh, just a really great spot to be. Being in Puffin Blind is a really incredible experience too. Um, this is where our razorbills and, and puffins loaf and breed. Um, that's a pufflin chick. And Petit Manan Point. So this is a mainland property. It's, we own um, just 2,100 acres. It's in Steuben. Um, this is down at the end that we like to call Bear Cove. So Bear Cove has its name because the swell coming into the cobble makes a roaring sound. Um, it's hard to get to. You have to walk all the way along the shore from our trails to get here. But it's uh, really cool. This is the end of the Hollingsworth Trail in winter. So it's beautiful all year round. Um, I spent a lot of time in our salt marshes. So Sawyer's Marsh, um, the Sawyer's um, division is over, it's just about a thousand acres in Millbridge and our salt marsh is pretty tiny. It's about, um, that actually looks like Gouldsboro, but anyway, it's about a hundred acres and all I spend time in these marshes um, we're collecting um, sediment data to monitor climate change. So we call them surface elevation tables. So I get to go every year. Um, and in the fall, they're just incredible. This is the um, Spartina in the fall. And I thought, man, this sure does look like a porcupine. It feels like a porcupine sort of um, when you walk across the marsh. And then um, in that very same spot, I looked up and there was a porcupine, which is pretty cool. Um, just waiting for me to, to go on so we could get back to what he was doing, I'm sure. And um, some interesting surprises. This, this marsh was um, used as um, people farmed the marshes um, historically, and there's actually like old clay pipes that have been exposed. Um, so there's history that you, you stumble on um, that you're not expecting. And Goldsboro Marsh. It's smaller. It's a uh, 27 acres. Egg Rock. So Jim has um, done an incredible job of maintaining our structures, especially our lighthouses. And um, Egg Rock is a really cool island. It's it's most visited by tour boats. So the puffin tours go by it. Um, and you know, it's like okay, Egg Rock. It's, it has galls on it. Um, it's kind of the touristy spot. Like that's where the tour boats go to see seals. But once I was on the roof of that lighthouse, I completely fell in love with the view. It's like no other island. And the view is much better looking out at the tour boats, I think, than looking in. <laughs> so that's uh, Mount Desert Island in the background in Acadia National Park. And that's the view from uh, we're doing some shingling there. Uh, ship Island, I we have such struggles with ship, but I still love it. It's one of our only sand beaches. Um, I actually find sand dollars on this beach, which is cool. And it's Blue Hill Bay is a, just a really productive, um, beautiful area in the summer. Great for boating and fishing. Um, it's also you know, dramatic in stormy weather. And 
believe it or not, Blue Hill Bay is one of our easiest islands to get to. And Jim and I almost didn't make it back to the boat on this day. It was, pictures don't do waves and wind justice. It was so rough um, and also so beautiful. But I, I took a picture and was like, we might die. I should probably put my phone away. <laughs> um, um, anyway, that's part of the nesting colony. It's it's not the best, but um, and this is uh, some um, gall chicks that were hatching on Trumpet Island. Um, they're also pretty incredible too. And then Matinic. I don't have a lot of pictures. They don't get down to Rockland enough. Um, this is the landing beach and the first cabin is the researcher cabin where Sequoia and Emma lived all summer. And then the last picture is a yellow warbler that um, one of our technicians, Zach Poland, took on Matinic. And that's the Xanathoria lichen that grows on the rocks. So um, Matinic is an incredible place for passerines and migration. We've done a lot of research out there and have had a lot of grad student, well, Adrian, one grad student, but a lot of different grad students use the data collected from Matinic. Um, it's definitely a migration hotspot. So that's it. Thank you for listening. So um, Sarah, if you want to um, unshare, you turn your screen share off. Yeah. And we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one is, um, have you ever used goats for vegetation management? We haven't tried goats. So the problem with goats is that um, they need water. The sheep don't actually need water. They get all of their um, moisture through the vegetation and they rely on, and they can also eat seaweed in the intertidal zone, which is really healthy for them. So um, a lot of other refuges are using goats with really, really good success. And I think that, um, if they're managed and if we we had an intensive area and period of time um it it could work but um sheep are kind of um a little bit easier for us here in maine um we can always get a farmer to give us sheep or to loan us sheep okay and um another question that came in is how did mink get on the islands was someone raising them originally so mink are just, a, they're native to this area and they're really good swimmers. Um, usually on the mainland, you'll find them along rivers and streams. Um, but the mink that live on the coast um, from the, the management that we did on Eastern Brothers Island for 10 years, we trapped Eastern Brothers Island, kept getting mink and finally said, okay, we need to trap the surrounding islands. We were trapping all of the surrounding islands and catching mink constantly. We had um, game cameras and the mink are, they're swimming in the winter on a regular basis, farther distances in the ocean than, than we ever would have expected. So it's not an accidental arrival. Um, almost every year after we close the ship island colony, um, we'll go back after the birds have left in September, October, and we'll find fresh mink scat. And, in the last 10 years that we've been there, we've never had a mink during the breeding season. So they are, they're, they're swimmers and they just get out there. And we also kind of think too that um, trapping isn't as popular. And so our mainland populations may be higher than they were historically. Um, so if anyone wants to trap mink on the mainland, we would definitely <laughs> appreciate the help on that. Right. <laughs> Well, our, our hour is has come and gone. Um, I am going to um, say thank you, Sarah, so much um, to let people know that we have recorded this tonight. And um, probably by uh, towards the end of next week, um, we'll have it up on our Facebook page, as well as if you go to the Friends website at maincoastislands.org. We have a video library and there's all sorts of great videos about the refuge and we'll have this one there as well. So um, thank you everybody. And you're getting lots of thank yous coming across on the chat here, Sarah, for you and- Great, thanks um, guys. Yeah. See you later. So good night everybody and um, <laughs> stay safe. <laughs>